Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I'm your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen. And I did want to point out a lot of people have, have taken advantage, several thousand people now have taken advantage of the free resource at reallifepharmacology.com. It's a 31-page PDF, top 200 drugs. I was recently reached out by a fellow pharmacist uh, who's teaching some uh, pharmacy technicians, and uh, definitely they found it to be a, a valuable resource uh, in helping uh, train, educate uh, healthcare professionals uh, to provide uh, better care there and to really highlight important uh, pearls with regards to the top 200 drugs there. So again, 31-page PDF, uh, check it out, reallifepharmacology.com. So again, I'm your host, Eric Christensen. If you want to reach out to me, uh, track me down at LinkedIn. And I think that's going to be it for uh, announcements today here. So let's get into the drug. Prochlorperazine is a medication, brand name Compazine. Uh, I've also heard Compro used before as well in clinical practice. And this is a bit of a complex uh, medication, at least as far as a mechanism of action uh, perspective goes. So this drug is classified uh, as an antiemetic, also can be classified as an antipsychotic. Now, I, I won't say that it's never used as an antipsychotic, but in, you know, 10 years approximately of clinical practice, uh, I have never seen this medication used as an antipsychotic. So uh, there may be a patient out there somewhere, but uh, again, this medication uh, is primarily used for its uh, anti-emetic, uh, anti-nausea uh, type purposes. Now that mechanism of action. So we've got some dopamine blocking activity at the D1 and D2 receptors. And because of that dopamine blocking activity, that is kind of the classic mechanism of uh, antipsychotics. However, dopamine uh, is an important uh, molecule within the brain in the chemoreceptor zone. And this zone area of the brain is a very uh, important kind of central control center for nausea and vomiting. And dopamine blockade in this area is what's likely suspected to help with emesis prevention and feelings of nausea. So that's you know primarily how it's it's going to, to work there. Um, in addition, it does have some anticholinergic activity, so that may play a role. Uh, and you can think about that as far as side effect profile. Uh, rarely there uh, there is some potential for uh, adrenergic receptor blocking activity as well, and I'll, again I'll, I'll kind of hint at that in the potential for um, adverse effects. But that dopamine blocking activity that's the the most likely activity uh, that's maybe helping out uh, in that that chemoreceptor zone uh, to help block uh, the feelings of of nausea and potentially emesis as well there. So one important aspect, I think, when you're talking about agents that help with nausea and vomiting is to remember uh, routes of administration. Because if somebody's uh, nauseous and they're throwing up and they take a prochlorperazine tablet and they throw it up within a minute, two minutes of taking it, they're not going to absorb any of that medication and it's not going to help at all. So with alternative dosage forms, injection, uh, rectal, we can uh, bypass that gut and obviously bypass the risk of them potentially uh, vomiting up that medication and you know not getting the benefit that we're intending them to get. So uh, important to, to recognize that. Uh, that nausea and vomiting medications will often have uh, alternative dosage forms, and, and prochlorperazine is, is no exception there. So the adverse effect uh, profile. So thinking about uh, the mechanism. So dopamine blockade, uh, we've got the potential for uh, EPS-type symptoms, so those, those movement-type symptoms. 
uh, elevations in prolactin can happen. Okay, again, not incredibly common, but with that mechanism, we do have to to think about that. Uh, QTC prolongation risk is there as well. Think about you know a lot of the other antipsychotics can contribute to that as well. Uh, so that's kind of on the the dopamine blocking uh, aspect. Now. We also mentioned prochlorperazine having anticholinergic activity. So we can remember those side effects. So they slow the GI tract down, uh, constipation. They also dry you up, dry eyes, dry mouth. Uh, urinary retention uh, could contribute to confusion. And again, a lot of these adverse effects are going to be dose-dependent and potentially frequency-dependent. So if you've got one patient that takes a very small dose and they take it, you know, once a month, once every six months for a little nausea here and there, it's probably not going to um, cause problems in, in most situations. Now, if you got a patient on a bunch of other meds and there's interactions and anticholinergic burden and, and all this other sort of stuff, that it is possible. There, there's, you know, nothing that's um, sometimes possible. But again, incidents of, of problems are likely going to be pretty rare if it's somebody that just seldom takes it as needed versus somebody that's popping them three, four times a day over the period of, you know, three to five days or a week, you might see some of these adverse effects start creeping in. Um, and again, kind of a, a dose dependent uh, manner there. Uh, one last one I, I wanted to, to mention, thinking about the mechanism, I mentioned uh, some of that adrenergic receptive blocking activity. So if we think of alpha blocking activity, uh, alpha blockers are used in the management of blood pressure uh, and BPH. So if you've got a drug that can cause, that has alpha blocking activity from an adverse effect profile, uh, we should think about orthostasis and, and dropping um, blood pressure and potentially getting it down too low. So again, kind of a, another thing, again, not incredibly common, but with the potential mechanisms of the way the drug works, and again, the dose that we're on, uh, that could potentially uh, show up there. So let's take a quick break here from our sponsor, and uh, we'll finish up with uh, drug interactions when we get back from the break here. So if you're looking for study material uh, for board certification, uh, we've got pharmacotherapy exam prep material, uh, we've got ambulatory care, geriatrics, medication therapy management, as well as NAPLEX content. If you're a student, uh, definitely go check out meded101.com slash store. Uh, if you're not a pharmacist, we've definitely got clinical resources uh, that are meant to help uh, educate you about things in the real world. So uh, Audible book, Pharmacotherapy, Audible book, Thrill of the Case. If you've never had an Audible book before, you can go snag those for free. Uh, great resources uh, that help you know really provide some of that real world experience that you know so many clinicians, young clinicians, and students are seeking out. So uh, lots of stuff that could benefit anyone from, uh, you know, pharmacy technician, nurse, nurse practitioner, uh, to a, a physician uh, and med student there as well. So go check that out, meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E. So finishing up on drug interactions here, uh, again, if you understand the mechanism and what that mechanism does, uh, we can think in the mindset of what other drugs would potentially cause those additive effects. So I think about dopamine blocking. If you've got an antipsychotic on board, we're going to pile on and potentially interact uh, with other antipsychotics and double up on that mechanism there. Uh, same thing with uh, anticholinergic and anticholinergic burden. If you've got a patient on, you know, Benadryl, hydroxazine, uh, maybe a, a TCA, uh, doxylamine, you know, all these drugs have anticholinergic effects. And if we add uh, prochlorperazine on top of that, we can really have that additive effect and the incidence of, you know, dry eyes, dry mouth, and, and all the other anticholinergic effects there. Uh, with, you know, dopamine blockade, anticholinergic uh, activity, 
uh, c- compazine can be a little bit sedating. So that is, that is something you, you might see there. And there again, I think of drugs with additive effects. So CNS depressant type medications. So, you know, we've got opioids, you know, your oxycodones, hydrocodones, th- th- that common class of, of medication there. Um, benzodiazepines are certainly a, a CNS depressant. Uh, some of the anti-seizure medications definitely can have some of that activity, uh, you know, sedation, things of that nature. Obviously, any medication, virtually any medication used for sleep um, can also have that additive effect. So uh, if you can remember uh, that mechanism of compazine or those three mechanisms of dopamine blocking activity, maybe alpha blocking activity and anticholinergic activity, uh, I think you can recognize other drugs uh, that may also have those activities and, and really pile on uh, to that adverse effect profile. So I think that's going to wrap it up for today. Uh, if you enjoy the podcast, leave a rating uh, and review on iTunes or wherever you're listening. Uh, so appreciative of all the people that have done that. Uh, that helps us reach more people. Uh, you know, if you like the podcast, share us. Um, you know, send it out to your, your class. If you're a pharmacy student or a med student, um, you know, share the, the benefit that, that you've received from it and uh, certainly help us uh, grow the, the audience of this podcast. My intent uh, is to teach as many healthcare professionals and future healthcare professionals as I possibly can uh, about the issues I care about, uh, which is, you know, pharmacology and the appropriate use of, of medications and medication safety. So feel free to, to do that. Again, I mentioned at the, the beginning there, reallifepharmacology.com. Uh, go snag that PDF. You can reach me. Probably the best way is on LinkedIn. I'm probably most active uh, on that social media platform. Again, Eric Christensen, uh, PharmD, uh, BCPS, BCGP. And I'm going to sign off for today. Thanks so much for listening and have a great rest of your day.